there have been a couple interviews in my life where I bored myself. <laughs> and, and that's bad. That's bad. So something's wrong. Something's wrong when that happens. And I remember interviewing Laura Bush because I knew from a friend. I said, do you do like your mother-in-law and use the Smithsonian to get your jewelry and wear it? She said, what are you talking about? I said, well, as First Lady, you have permission to go to the Smithsonian and borrow jewelry and wear it. She said, I do. <laughs> and that's what you hope for. And so when we ended the interview, I said, what are you doing this afternoon? And she said, first... I'm going out to smell the roses, literally the Harry and David roses in the Rose Garden of yeah. the White House, which was fun for our viewers to hear. And she said, then I'm headed to the Smithsonian. <laughs> <laughs> Ben's Town President Dave Chachi Dennis loves radio and all of his radio friends. Hey, Chachi. Hey, everybody. Because Chachi loves everybody. <laughs> My next guest is the owner and president of the longest continuously operated independent broadcast organization in the Western United States. Under her leadership, the company has expanded its holdings to include five television stations across California and Oregon, three cable systems, and a cutting-edge digital HD video production company. Beyond her business acumen, her commitment to community service has been unwavering. Through her stations and personal efforts, she's consistently given back to the communities they serve. In addition to her executive roles, she's hosted the successful TV interview series, Up Close and Personal, where she's had insightful conversations with prominent figures such as Hillary Clinton, Lester Holt, Jay Leno, Jeff Zucker, and Walter Cronkite. She's also been an active leader with numerous boards and organizations, including the NBC Affiliate Board, National Associations of Broadcasters Board, the World Affairs Council of Oregon, Oregon's Children's Foundation, and the boards of both Southern Oregon University and Willamette University. Her contributions to both the industry and community have not gone unnoticed. She's been honored with numerous accolades, including the National Broadcasters Foundation Pioneer Award, the Oregon Association of Broadcasters Tom McCall Award, and the prestigious Governor's Gold Award for her service to the state of Oregon. And in November, the Library of American Broadcasting Foundation will be presenting her with the Giants of Broadcasting and Electronics Art Award. Please join me in welcoming the owner of California, Oregon Broadcasting, Patsy Smolin. Patsy, so nice to meet you. Thank you, Dave. Thanks very much. I would love to dive in and uh, I'm going to tease you here within a second. I have a friend that I went to school with that used to work for you in Medford. And I'm going to bring that back around in a little bit. Uh, but I've heard nothing but just wonderful things about you and uh, what a uh, tremendous human being you are and broadcaster. So it's an honor. Well, thank you. But who is this gentleman? <laughs> he was a reporter for you. His name was, uh, or his name is Scott Burton. Sure. And yeah, he said he only met you a, a handful of times. This was, <laughs> I'm going to be dating myself a little bit, but this was after we graduated from college. So this has been around like probably uh, 2000, 2001, somewhere in that, in that era. But yeah. uh, well, please tell him hi and tell I, him we're, we're always looking for a reporter. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will. He's doing really well. He's in Portland now and uh, he's actually out of media. He's gone on to uh, go into the healthcare uh, industry, but he, oh, uh, for him. he's the president of a, of a large uh, healthcare company and, uh, um, insurance company. I'm sorry, the name is escaping me right now, but he's he's doing great. Good, uh, good. Uh, he told me that you are you are a legend and uh, w one of the nicest human beings he's ever met, and he really that, enjoyed. It's very cool to hear. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Let's jump in about growing up. I want to hear all about your childhood, and I also want to hear about your legendary father, William Smolin. Paint the picture, if you don't mind, of a bit about your childhood. Was it idyllic? Your father was obviously very entrepreneurial and, and a titan, so was there pressure for you to, to, to go into the industry? No. Uh, I'm the youngest of five children. At the time that I went into the industry, there was no pressure because three or four of my older siblings were in it. And I remember my dad saying there were plenty of small kids in the biz. There was no reason that I should feel any pressure to come into it. And I certainly did not think I ever would. As I look back, I think it was more a, a feeling of being afraid I wouldn't be successful in it. So though my plan was specifically to go into social work, it was only because I was traveling through Southern Oregon on my way to visit relatives in Spokane, Washington, and, and um, we had a snowstorm, and I had ball tires, and 
stopped in Medford to work for a few weeks and get some money to get some new tires. And actually, the person running my dad's cable systems at the time in California and Oregon said his office manager just walked off the job and could I help him for a little bit? And I said, yeah, till I can buy my new tires. <laughs> and so I did and I fell in love and had starting in the cable side of our operations and worked in this company ever since. I read an article uh, that was sent to me. I want to credit the Rogue Valley Times article, and it really was a a great piece about you. And it talked a bit about uh, you got to spend some time with President Kennedy at uh, Shasta Dam and how that was influenced or how that greatly influenced your career. Yeah, it did. I was uh, in eighth grade at the time, and and he was coming to – Redding, California, to dedicate Whiskey Town Dam at Whiskey Town Lake, and my dad asked if I wanted to skip a day of school and go to Redding and and uh, help him with the live feed he was doing from Redding to the rest of the United States. So I did get to meet him, and still to this day, the most charismatic person I've ever met. And um, it was one of the first things he did officially after that dedication was. Texas. And that, of course, is where he was killed. So as a very young and easily influenced person, that was a very big day in my life when he died, followed by my dad was meeting with Robert Kennedy when he was running for president in Eureka, California, where I grew up. And um, I spent the day with Robert Kennedy and my father. And he got on a plane to LA and uh, my dad was going to LA. So he flew down with him. And then that night we watched him get on television, get killed. So tragic. And that was just a few years uh, within each other. Right. And so it had a huge impression on me and the fact that two pretty incredible men losing their lives and the importance of sharing the information all over the world and watching my dad do the news story at the same time that you're so emotionally involved, both certainly with the Bobby Kennedy and even more with John F. Kennedy, and wanting to make sure that the world understood exactly the facts of what was happening. And um, while you're personally feeling a tremendous loss as an American. As your father being the titan that, that he was, was he pretty demanding of you when you guys were, were kids? Were you expected to get good grades? And it sounds like you guys were very active politically. And so uh, uh, did you feel that as a child? Well, you can't be too politically active if you're in broadcasting, and our focus was always news, so you have to be really careful about that if you feel strongly that news be unbiased and always get both sides of the story and always check at least three sources before something airs. So you look at at news a little differently than you would otherwise if you weren't growing up in in a broadcast family. No, he wasn't demanding. Probably I felt more pressure just being the youngest of five kids and the older ones were all pretty darn smart. (laughs) I think that's where the pressure came from, not not from him. I think he was, by the time I came along, a lot more relaxed than he may have been with the oldest. Tell me about uh, going to school and uh, graduating from Oregon State University. What did you study there? I majored in journalism and minored in psychology. Both fields still incredibly interesting to me. Obviously, always will be. And at that point, were you still thinking about going down the the healthcare path? I wasn't thinking about anything other than having fun in college, I think. <laughs> well, good, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> so you got your first gig. You're saving up money to get new tires. And that's when you, <laughs> you, you fall in love with the business. And at that point, you're just doing some administrative uh, clerical work at the station. No, at that point, I was strictly in his cable TV operations. I wasn't in broadcasting at all. I see. So I was doing things like selling cable TV door to door when cable was about having a better signal and watching I Love Lucy reruns. Um, (laughs) I guess they weren't reruns at that point. And so it was not easy at all. And I was a kid and I was selling cable door to door and coming home. this, This was a strong memory coming home at night with all kinds of product like Avon and vegetables and quilts and flowers. And because I thought if I bought everybody else's stuff, they'd buy mine, but they did not. (laughs) 
I couldn't sell. I was having a terrible time selling. So I'd come home with all this stuff, and then I didn't understand why my dad wasn't bummed out about it. Um, he would just laugh and say, good job, try again tomorrow. Also, I would go to the homes where people weren't paying their cable bills to the non-pays. And I distinctly remember going to a whorehouse to collect money. And, oh, my gosh. And where I was successful. And I also remember going to a house where the woman was on her way to jail to bail out her husband. And she stood there thinking, and I stood there hoping I could somehow also get my money for the, <laughs> for the cable product. And she decided actually to pay me and um, forget about him. She left him in jail, and she went back in to watch television into her house. So lots of incredible memories, you know, learning how to climb a cable TV pole and talk about starting from the ground up. Oh, I, I love this. I mean, did it get confrontational at times when you're going to collect someone's cable bill? Absolutely. And were you by yourself? Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that was in one of the towns we served. We uh, He built cable systems throughout Northern California and Southern Oregon, like way before Portland had cable. Yeah, he started a cable TV company in Oregon and Northern California, as mentioned, and this was before CNN, and he had the foresight to bring in Portland and San Francisco TV channels. Correct. So at that point, if you were in Medford, you couldn't get San Francisco and Portland channels, and this allowed them now to get bigger market TV effectively? Exactly. Yeah, we took it for granted. So this was before cable was even in Portland, Oregon. And a lot of times, I'm sure as you're going door to door, probably a lot of the potential customers didn't even know what cable was, I'm guessing. So you'd yeah. have to educate them and give them the whole pitch. You bet. I mean, what a great way to learn. I mean, I, I have so much respect for account executives. I still think that that's the toughest job in the business. And so I, I respect anyone that can go and sell and has done that. So do I. Did then, do now. I still work with our sales staff frequently and know them all. And um, I'm still just plain blown away by why it's as difficult as it is. And of course, television is more confusing than it's ever been. Sure. <laughs> and that uh, you're brilliant if you can find what you want on your screen. And I should note, note this, my background is, is radio. And so most of my interviews are with radio uh, personalities and executives. So uh, excuse me if I get some TV things wrong, but I'm really enjoying learning about it. And obviously the two businesses have been adjacent, are adjacent. And your father started in radio, correct? Newspaper, actually, oh, and newspaper. then radio, and then television, and then cable television, and microwave, and digital, and yeah, all of it. I mean, his, I remember his line was always, you know, that he loved communications any way that people wanted to get it. You have right now, you oversee five, five television stations, and then you guys divested in like the 80s of the cable business, or are you guys still in the cable business? Uh, we currently are not in the cable business. He grew his cable operations throughout Oregon and Northern California during the same years that he was growing with his television stations. And he did that up until just before Ronald Reagan's presidency that the uh, FCC decided that you couldn't own both cable and radio and oh, television. Oh, I see. You have I understand. Best. So he said, well, we'll stay with the ones we came with, meaning television, and kept the TV stations. We've had up to about 14 television stations throughout the years and sold the cable. And then um, right away, we did buy some smaller cable systems in Central and Eastern Oregon because we had to, to give up the ones where we started in Oregon and Northern California. And because, as I remember him saying, we did not want to be in broadcasting without being in cable because we'd be stupid. <laughs> <laughs> we needed to, under needed to understand both industries. I, I wish I could have met your, met your father. <laughs> but it sounds like, you know, he was, he was that era of, of ten, Ted Turner and John Malone and these big titans in the business. I mean, they really were at their time in a lot of ways, very similar to maybe like what a Mark Zuckerberg is today in the, in the digital realm. Right. And if you have the opportunity to work with those kind of people, and of course, in my case, I was just lucky. He was also a guy of great character and kindness. And because he was working in radio when there were no men at the radio station because they're all in the war. He learned that women could do everything men could do. So we never had that issue in our company. And it was nice to just the, the fact that it never existed, that women couldn't do things that men 
could. Sure. And we kind of, in a lot of ways, take that for granted now, but you had a much more difficult road than what a, a male would yeah, at that time. Yeah, people just don't, no use in even talking about it because people don't believe the stories of how women used to be treated in business. You are a, you are a trailblazer in, in, in many, many ways. After your your job of, of doing door-to-door sales and collecting uh, late cable bills, what was your next job at the at the station? Customer. And no, this is strictly in cable. Oh, um, this was strictly okay, cable, station. sorry. Yeah, I worked with all of our cable systems throughout these towns of Oregon and Northern California, and I worked in customer relations uh, as a customer rep and then even sort of late office manager. And, and then there was not a job I didn't do in cable until eventually I was running our cable operations. I mean, that's really impressive. And at this point, you must, I mean, you're right out of school. So you're pretty, pretty young. And yes. this is a, a brand new technology. You're certainly in its early days. What came after the first, you're obviously piping in from Portland and San Francisco stations, but what other programming did you guys offer? We offered all, of course, the local channels. And we brought in um, from other cities in Oregon and California and when I remember when we, when HBO first came out, when we were deciding to take that, then Showtime came out, the two first two pace movie services, and you had to choose. And uh, as, a, as a cable system, you could only take one. And my father said, well, then we'll wait till we can take both. <laughs> and they were appalled. And <laughs> the HBO and Showtime reps would come to town and they'd stay in different motels and they wouldn't speak to each other. And so entirely competitive. Oh, that's fascinating. So they, the content providers or cha- content providers were essentially uh, pitching you on why their con- you should choose their content over the others. Absolutely. And then one day they realized my father was serious. We were not taking either one of them until we could take them both. And they finally agreed to do that. And we were the first in the country for that to exist, to have both HBO and Showtime. Hard to believe now. That's fascinating. Yeah. So interesting. And And I remember him saying, someday there will be hundreds of channels, just like the magazine business. He said, no, let's start out with a couple of magazines. So look now, hundreds and hundreds of them. And there was always something fun to learn working with him. Yeah, he was certainly right about that. And you had become, and as I'm looking at your your, your bio, and thank you for sending me all this uh, all this great research, you were the vice president of Southern Oregon Cable Television, and then you became the president of Oregon Cable Television. So at that point, you were in your, your 30s, your late right. 20s. 20s and 30s, right. Obviously, your your father is sounds like a very commanding, um, out of commanding is the right word, but he's, he's a titan, and so he's got a presence. He was challenging. Challenging. Good. All right. I, I like that word. Was it hard for you being a woman and being his daughter to get respect when you're in a role of that size? Or did, did people kind of see you as his daughter or did they see you for who you are? Well, number one, I think that it's far easier to be the daughter of the founder or the owner than the son. No one ever expected me to be my dad or to act like my dad or to look like my dad. Uh, so there just wasn't the pressure that I would see with sons, including my own brothers, of my father. They, um, as much as my parents would tell them not to compare themselves to him, because, you know, there are only so many pioneers, right? <laughs> um, and entrepreneurs like that, that, I think they still did. And I think that was a lot of, lot of pressure on them that I didn't have to put up with. Nobody ever expected me to be a clone of my father, including me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he was in, incredibly proud. And I want to talk about that in a minute. But does the extension or ascension is the right word uh, from going to the vice president of Southern Oregon Cable and then president of Oregon Cable and then onto the president, did you stay in the same building or were you moving around at that point? Primarily stay in the same building. We're kind of talking about two different things here. One was the cable operations that we owned, the family owned, and that's where I was vice president and uh, another person was president. And then the other part, what you were talking about, the Oregon Cable Association, that's, that was the separate association to promote cable in the state. So. 
Completely makes sense. Let's let's hone in right now, just being the VP and then the president, not of the association, but of the business. What does your day-to-day become now as you're an executive, uh, as opposed to what it was when you were going door-to-door? Oh, um, it was just learning the entire industry and learning how to administrate it and manage it and working with all the city councils to establish franchises and keep those franchises. And right away in the cable business, you learned how to work with politicians because you weren't in business if you weren't getting along with the local city councils. So that's what started a lot of, lot of interest in communication with local, state, federal officials. Let's delve into that for a second because this is all new to me. So you would actually have to go into city councils and uh, propose that you become their cable system within that community? And then renegotiate those franchises over and over and over in little oh. tiny towns all over the West. I had no idea. And then do you have to pay them like a license fee or? A franchise fee, correct. And then you're pitching against other cable companies that are trying to do the same thing. You could be. Generally speaking, there was only one cable company to a town. I see. I see. So you spent because a lot of time. Too, it was too expensive to have more than one. I see. And you spent a lot of time then negotiating with city councils and presenting to them. and City councils, city managers, mayors. And so, yeah, that's where I developed my interest in working with government officials and learning from government officials and making sure at lots of times in, in TV, people will say, why do you care so much about one viewer? Well, that comes from my cable background because you cared about every single subscriber. You do anything to keep them happy. Uh, your customer. I, I love our customers. And I feel I the same that way philosophy. about our viewers and our clients in broadcast. That's great. I love that whole ethos, if you will. The Library of American Broadcasting Foundation presents the Giants of Broadcasting and Electronic Arts Luncheon. Join us on November 12th at Gotham Hall in New York City. This prestigious event will be emceed by Bill Whitaker of 60 Minutes and CBS News. Honoring the 2024 LABF Giants of Broadcasting and Electronic Arts. Al Roker, Christine Baranski, Mike McVeigh, Patsy Smolin, Stephen A. Smith, Steve Jones, and Wendy McMahon. Plus, Hearst Television receives the LABF Excellence in Broadcasting Preservation Award. Proceeds benefit the preservation and expansion of the Library of American Broadcasting and the education initiatives of the Broadcast Education Association. For event sponsorship and ticket information, visit tvradiolibrary.org. Be a part of preserving the past, reflecting the present, and informing the future. tvradiolibrary.org. So let's talk in terms of like the infrastructure. How does that work? I've always been really fascinated. Is it your responsibility to to run all that cable and make sure that the cable is in everyone's home? Absolutely. Oh my gosh. And I feel the same with broadcast. And and that is, you know, that's the philosophy my father taught me in terms one by one by one by one and then cable. And I feel the same at broadcast that every single viewer is, absolutely important, whether or not they're ever going to advertise. And uh, certainly every single client is very important. And you uh, now when most people don't even realize that you can have free over the air television still free with just an antenna, there are the broadcasters who can't believe I will go out with an antenna if somebody's in the boonies and wants our signal and can't get it. And um, again, one viewer at a time. That's a very impressive customer service. And when you would go into a community and let's say you were taking over for another cable system, did you have to replace all the infrastructure or could you use the infrastructure that was already in place? That's why I said all these years, there's just been one cable system primarily in each town because I see. nobody can afford yeah. to do that. Seems like such an incredible expense to have to do that. And just the amount of technicians you must have that are going out and and doing these installs for you. Right. The only way normally that suddenly the town would be working with a different cable system would be if you did something terrible and the city decided that you were going away and another cable system was coming in. I see. But when your dad started this, he was one of the one of the very first in the entire country. So he actually had to build that infrastructure out. Exactly. That's amazing. Yeah. And that takes, I mean, you're talking like heavy equipment and trenches oh, yeah. and cranes. Yeah. So, of and, course, he had to start a construction company to make sure that they did just that. 
oh, I, I love this story. So much goes into it. That <laughs> it's amazing. I never would think about, honestly, on the radio side, because we're, as right. you know, like television, we broadcast and we don't have to worry about plugging into each house directly. Fascinating. And you were already in radio in some of the best days of radio, the yeah. most fun of radio. Radio is best. It's- yeah, radio is a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. We've had, uh, you know, we've taken some licks lately, but uh, it's still, I, I still have such a great time. I worked, my first job was at KFMB in San Diego. I worked at the radio station, but they had a CBS affiliate there just down the hall. And so I used to go down. That's where oh. I met my buddy, Scott. He was an intern there who went on to go work for you. And uh, that's where I got to meet him. And uh, I've always been on the radio side and he went down the TV path. But I've always been, we've been adjacent to it. And I'm so fascinated to learn from you about well, television. We never would have gotten out of radio, but we wound up having less and less people who we could find to hire for radio. And eventually we had less and less people to manage the radio side and wound up uh, giving our last radio station to Southern Oregon University and sticking just on the TV and cable side. And I do want, you mentioned Southern Oregon University and some of your charitable work, and I'm going to get to that at the end because your foundation and everything you do is really quite remarkable. I'm very impressed with how much you give to your community, and I do want to dive into that. A little bit of a tease there. So in 82, you joined the broadcast side of uh, KOBI, and I got to see a few interviews of you on KOBI and some of the packages that you've produced. And you're a very good journalist, and uh, let's talk about transitioning over to KOBI and now going from cable into broadcast. What was that like for you? So in uh, spring of 1982, I joined the broadcast side. Not at all the experience I'd had in cable. I didn't get to start at the bottom, which is certainly my preferred way to manage is to know what I'm doing (laughs) (laughs) and to have worked on every aspect of it. And I was in a leadership role without having done every job in television. So it was a quick learning curve and it was challenging. And um, I probably never know broadcasting as well as I knew cable as a result of, of learning that industry when I was a kid. But I do also love broadcasting. It's a wonderful industry. I think it's super important that it continue. And the, my favorite part of it, of course, is news. And um, that's what I spent a lot of time with in college, in high school, the high school newspaper, and carried on in, in terms of that love with making sure our goal was always to make sure that it's fair and unbiased and I remember one day a um, the TV station, the news director was out, the general manager was out, the person came in and wanted to interview for a job, so I was doing the interview, and she said, how many must carries do you do a day? And I said, I don't even know what you're talking about. What's a must carry? And she said, well, you're the owner, aren't you? And I said, yeah. So, and she said, well, a must carry is are the news stories that you mandate every single day. And she said, and we have to report them, which, of course, one of the large broadcast corporations in the country was actively doing at the time and uh, must carry news stories. And I said, well, about every 10 years, there'll be an old bit that nobody in the newsroom knows him. And I do. And I think we better let people know he died. And uh, she looked at me and she said, you are kidding. And I said, no, I said, no, you decide your news stories when you work here. And if we know anything about that news story, we'll sure let you know what, what we are aware of. That's a great story. So you gave your news and continue to give your newsrooms a lot of autonomy, it sounds like. We do five and a half hours of local news a day and they're in charge. That's that's a lot of content to have to put out every, oh, every single day. It is. It's a lot. Back to when you first made that transition, what was your first job at the TV station? Uh to co-manage it. <laughs> oh my gosh. So you yeah. they really threw you threw you in the fire. Yeah. He got did. it. My dad. Right. Your dad. Yeah. Why? It, it, and did he make that decision for you to move there because you guys had the divest at that point of the cable? Exactly right. I see. And by that time, I'd had a much, enough management experience to uh, be aware of what I did not know and help where I could. Was that a tough decision for the family to either sell the TV stations or the cable? Yes. I, you know, the cable to me were, were my kids, hundreds of them, and um, I felt very, very close to the industry. It sounds so hokey, all of this, but it's it's small market broadcasting. Yeah, that's not at all. And, and being the owner of the business, I get it. I own part owner in this business, and it's nowhere near the size of your corporation. But it, it's like a child in a lot of ways. Absolutely. And 
you've got this sense of community and family and all these things that tie into it. And Yeah, and, I, and by extension, everybody you work with in the community becomes such a big part uh, of your life as well. And it sounds like you didn't have a choice. It was mandated by the by the government that you guys had to had to sell. Um, yes, so I, I get it. I'm sure that was upset about. Right. I'm sure that was a very challenging time. So you get in, you're thrown into now the television adjacent businesses, but very different because cable at that point, you weren't really creating content. You're distributing content. Whereas, and that's a very operational business. It sounds like an infrastructure based business where now on the TV side, you are obviously broadcasting and you're creating a lot of news. Tell me a little bit about, I know you're at KOBI is an NBC affiliate, but what makes you decide to be a CBS affiliate versus an ABC affiliate or an NBC affiliate? How are those decisions made? Well, in those days, as you well know, you were paid by the network. Oh, I didn't know that. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The network paid you. So you would negotiate with the networks in regards to the financial arrangement. A lot of it would depend on what network the other TV stations in your community were with and who was doing the best job and who was getting the most viewership. And for different reasons at different times, we were with different networks like our flagship, which is here in Medford, Oregon. Uh, we started out as a CBS affiliate. We then became years later an ABC affiliate. And then we became after that an NBC affiliate. So it all depended on the nature of the business at the time. That's, I had no idea. I knew I've been to Promax a few times because we do a lot of, of voiceover work, but I got to see kind of, you know, by being at Promax that, you know, the different networks would be there and they'd be presenting what their lineups are for the fall and all the new shows and so forth. And so would that weigh into it as well? Like the content, you know, obviously in the nineties when NBC was really hot with Seinfeld and, uh, uh, um, friends must, and must so forth. TV. Must see yes. TV. Yeah. Yeah. So would that help weigh into your guys' decision that as well? Definitely weighed into it. And then we have a very, very large coverage area of 12 counties for this one station. And so what other TV stations throughout the market, what networks they were with or not with, or if they got out of the business or if they change their network, that would create a change possibly for us. We changed from ABC to NBC because that made us at the time one of only two NBCs in the state. Whereas before with ABC, we were, there were several. So decisions like that. That's really, thank you for sharing that. And again, I appreciate you tolerating my lack of knowledge, but I'm learning so much here and I find it really good. interesting. Good. You obviously must be doing really well because you get promoted a couple of years later and now you're president and you're running the, the, the whole company. Is your father, is he still, and this is uh, 1984, is he still around at this point? Yes, he, okay. he died in 1995. Okay. And he worked full time until he died. He was 87 when he died. I see. Was he like the chairman at that point or was yeah. he still involved on a, on a day to day? Still working every day. Was that ever challenging to work for your dad? Was there sometimes some, some conflict there? I don't think there was ever any doubt in my mind that he was the boss. And I, even if I didn't understand his decisions initially, I always would before long. Yeah. And he was always very open-minded. He always gave me more responsibility than I wanted. <laughs> so that wasn't a big issue. Conflict was not a big issue. He was the smartest staff member I had and the most open-minded. And I, to this day, miss working with him. Sounds like he was a visionary and yeah. a, a pioneer. And he uh -huh. certainly, you were his daughter, but he must have seen a lot in you and you've proved him correct in, in him. You that's, know. that's still the goal. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> What is now your day to day as you're running a group station? So at this point, and you've got, I'm doing the math right now, you're 30, you're 31 maybe, and you are running two radio stations, 10 TV stations, and you had three cable systems at this point too. So it must have been right before you guys had the divest of cable. I mean, that is a gigantic role. And I'm guessing a thousand plus employees, something like that. Oh, no, a few hundred. Oh, a few hundred. Okay. That's still a really big operation. Yes, but. We had a lot of terrific long-term managers who knew what they were doing. What is your day-to-day? -day? Because I think at that level, you spend a lot of your day, unfortunately, putting out fires and you're dealing with everything from HR issues to uh, operational problems or, you know, clients that are unhappy or whatever it may be. Was that where you, how you're spending a lot of your time? I think personnel is always a huge amount of your time if you're in management 
with any industry. So the answer is yes to that. I think actually management personnel now is more difficult than it's been in the 50 years I've been in the business. It's a whole different world. I look back at news departments. You, I'm sure you can relate to that. They worked like 24-7 and yeah. had a ball. Yes. With, they loved their jobs. Then They loved investigative reporting. That was just a whole lot of passion. It's very, very different today. Uh, work is sometimes not a part. I mean, old-fashioned professional work is sometimes not a part of people's lives at all, and certainly not seven days a week. That seemed to be the most fun. Yeah, I, I agree with you completely. I've seen it the same on the radio side, and there's no doubt that it changed. And I think some of it sh- for sure for the better, but I also think some of it for, for, for the worse. And I think the pandemic probably accelerated some of those changes, yes. and it's tougher to get that feeling of camaraderie that we had uh, with you know more people working remotely. And I understand there's advantages to that and disadvantages to it. I don't want to, as you said, I want to have journalistic integrity and look at both sides of it. Exactly. But It's very important to do that. And some of us have to work harder than others to stay current, whether you're breaking some new federal law that didn't even know existed or yeah, yeah. You know, a whole lot more stress that way than you know, I'd rather just be working and having fun working. Let's pivot into up close and personal. Uh, when did you first decide to do up close and personal? And before we, I ask you that question, I want to just list some of these incredible guests that you've had over the years. Uh, Tom Brokaw, uh, Barbara Bush, uh, you've had Dick Clark, Hillary Clinton, Elizabeth Dole, uh, Wayne Newton. I watched your episode with the Oak Ridge Boys, which was fantastic. Uh, Dr. Oz, Dr. Phil, uh, Barbara Walters, uh, Jeff Zucker. I mean, the list goes on and on. It's really an impressive uh, guest list. How did it come to be? And uh, let, let's dive into that a little bit. It's all, it's all pretty simple. One day, the first woman to ever run for vice president, Geraldine Ferraro, was in Medford, Oregon. I remember she was with Mondale, right? Yeah. Yes, I remember. She was here on the campaign trail. And um, I just happened to be walking past the news department and listening to their conversation and no one wanted to cover her. No one wanted to go interview her. And so I was back at my desk mumbling to myself and how could that be the first woman to ever run for this position? How could there not be many people dying to interview her? So my father was walking by when I was mumbling and he said, what's the matter? And I told him and he said, well, quit your complaining and go do it yourself. Well, that's not what I knew how to do, but I did. And so I was supposed to go get like a three minute thing, you know, and I came back a couple hours later, just <laughs> hiring a kite about meeting her and talking to her. And um, that was my first interview. And then it took off from there. Uh, amazing. And you just kind of mimicked what you had seen on your own news staff do in the past or. Sure. Yeah. I mean, if you were to ask my friends, they'd say it was nothing new. You've been interviewing people since you were five years old. (laughs) Just because I enjoy people and I always would rather listen to them than have them asking me questions. (laughs) You're a natural at it. You're really good. I also watched your series with uh, Lester Holt, which was, I think, three or four episodes. Did you record that or did you actually go to, is Lester Holt in D.C. or New York? New York, is that where he does the show? New York, and that's where I went. And I think I was on his set. Most all my interviews, I go to them because I'm always doing what makes it easier for them. And almost all my interviews are as a result. I wouldn't get them. I wouldn't necessarily get them myself. It's usually through someone that I know that knows them. Like uh, Barbara Bush was extremely close to the senators from Oregon. She and her husband came into Congress with another senator from Medford, as well as uh, Senator Mark Hatfield from Oregon. Those three couples were extremely close. So when it was heard that I was really wanting to interview Barbara Bush, then her friend, who was also my friend, set it up for me. And then I got to interview her daughter-in-law, Laura, and her granddaughter, Jenna. So three generations, pretty fun. A lot of things in common, but Barbara Bush was definitely one other kind. 
That's terrific. I mean, how exciting, A, to interview people of that stature. You're about the highest level stature person I've interviewed, and I'm nervous doing this. So I couldn't even imagine. <laughs> you, don't, you don't act it. You don't act it. <laughs> I, I couldn't imagine uh, interviewing people. I, I did get to interview Curtis Leggett from the NAB, which was, uh, that was very intimidating because he's so intelligent and a Cornell graduate. He's really articulate, isn't he? Very articulate. Yeah. What was it like to be on the board of the National Association of Broadcasters? <laughs> well, again, memories flow, and a lot of them have to do with my father. I remember that when I was running, I would phone everybody on that board to ask for their support. And I remember going to my dad and saying, really good news. They're all saying yes. And he said, they all lie. They all lie. <laughs> and I was like, are you serious? And he goes, oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, I said, oh, so just because they say they're going to vote for me doesn't mean they will. He said, definitely not. So that was my first awakening. And then my second was that he said, because in those days, board meetings were a week long, all day for a full week. Most everybody on, there was only one woman, of course, They a huge board. Most of them were originally a DJ. So they loved their voices. And they, would, <laughs> they would talk forever. And then, so he told me, he said, if it's already been said, or you can tell it's about to be said, don't waste your time or theirs. Don't say anything. So I didn't. Two things came as a result of that. One, after I'd listened to hours and hours and hours of them repeating themselves, I looked at the schedule for the wives' agenda, what they were doing. And they were having lunch with Barbara Bush and they were going to an inside tour of the Smithsonian or so what they were learning and doing was far better than what the board was doing. <laughs> so a couple of times I did sneak out with the permission of the chair of the board and that's how I met Barbara Bush. And then the other thing, of course, was that there were, it was all male, definitely all male. When I got back to Oregon, my dad said, how'd it go? And I said, fine, I guess. And he goes, I got several phone calls saying you did a great job. And I said, Dad, I didn't speak for five days. Because <laughs> I followed your advice. And he said, well, what's that tell you? They, they thought you were really smart. And I said, okay, I just won't speak. And uh, anyway, so again, memories from those days. But I, I did serve for a long time on the NAB board and on the NBC board. Very educational experiences. Yeah, twice on the NAB board. It looks like uh, two terms, two four-year terms. And then uh, what was it like being on the NBC board? What kind of decisions are made on that board? Well, it depends what decade you're talking about. Um, the power of the affiliate has become less and less and less with each passing year. When I first served on the NBC affiliate board, it still was quite influential in negotiations with the network um, and in influencing the network on behalf of your viewers and clients. And the affiliates, have, as each year has passed, had less and less and less power. But in the days that I served on it, I, I think we were pretty fortunate in being able to communicate well with the people running NBC, and um, I loved working with them. And you got to work, and I know one of the uh, people you interviewed in Up Close and Personal was Jeffrey Zucker, and you also, and the name is escaping me, but who was the wonder kid, not unlike yourself, who at a very young age, I think he had family ties and the Cosby show. He passed away at a very young age. He was the programming guy for NBC. I think his oh, name was Brandon Tartikoff. Brandon Tartikoff. Thank you. Did you ever get to work with him? What a guy. Brandon's best friend was from here, Medford, Oregon. Unbelievable talent. And he was running much like you at a very young age, was in a very high position at NBC and running their programming and had a series of hit television shows. And in regards to up close and personal, and I know I'm kind of jumping around again, and my apologies for that. That's um, and that's why I'm going to need some of your tips when I get to meet you in person in New York for your giants of broadcast. That's the way my mind works too. So, okay. <laughs> Do you prep differently for a politician versus a celebrity? Like was your prep different for the Oak Ridge boys uh, versus uh, Barbara v Bush versus Al Roker? I have found that the best thing I can do is not prep. I have written questions only in case I get nervous and need them. I try not to prep because I try to treat it kind of like the old days on an airplane, not now, but the old days of commercial flying where you'd sit down and you go, so I'm Patsy, I'm Joe. So what do you do, Joe? You know, you, and um, just start talking to someone 
like you would when you first met them. And the whole point is to not be a 60 minutes on these to help our viewers get to know somebody as a person that they might not meet themselves. That's the whole idea. Thank you for sharing that insight. I love that. And I think it's probably why that series, what it worked is it's very authentic. And I feel when I'm watching it, and I've only watched a handful, but it's, it's conversational and you ask interesting questions and it feels like it's prepped. And I've always kind of, and when I say it feels like it's prepped just because your questions are so good, but it feels like it's an authentic conversation. Does that make sense? Yes. And, yeah. and thank you. That's a compliment. That's my hope. And then the other thing is to always remember that you ask the question and then the next question should probably have nothing to do with what you've got written down. It would just be based like a conversation. You know, what, what you say to me leads me to say something very different than I had intended to you based on what you have to say and to let you talk and to not interrupt you. And there have been a couple interviews in my life where I bored myself. <laughs> and, and that's bad. That's bad. So something's wrong. Something's wrong when that happens. And I remember interviewing Laura Bush because I knew from a friend. I said, do you do like your mother-in-law and use the Smithsonian to get your jewelry and wear it? She said, what are you talking about? I said, well, as first lady, you have permission to go to the Smithsonian and borrow jewelry and wear it. She said, I do. <laughs> and that's what you hope for. And so when we ended the interview, I said, what are you doing this afternoon? And she said, first, I'm going out to smell the roses, literally the Harry and David roses in the Rose Garden of yeah. the White House, which was fun for our viewers to hear. And she said, then I'm headed to the Smithsonian. <laughs> so, and then, so that makes your interview a little different than everybody else. And that's a thrill. Oh, that's a great factoid, by the way. I had no idea that, uh, that yeah, the first lady or the president could do that. Oh, walk out with a Hope Diamond around their neck. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> there must be a limit, but I don't know what it is. Here's an unscripted question, but I'm very curious uh, because I think the television industry is going through some of the same issues that the radio business is going through with some audience erosion and just uh, a challenge in the business, uh, you know, from a revenue standpoint and a listener and viewer standpoint. What are you guys doing locally to help circumvent that? We can't circumvent that. Uh, what we do is emphasize localism as much as we did our industry did in the 1950s and the 1960s. It's all about the communities we serve. It's about what interests them. It's about talking to them, interviewing them, localism, 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 because we feel that niche is still there. Uh, I'm very grateful for what you do for your community, and some of your awards are really impressive. I'm going to go over just a few of them, but the NAB awarded you the Chuck Sherman Award uh, in 2019. Uh, it's named in honor of late Dr. Charles E. Sherman to recognize an individual demonstrating lifelong leadership, service, and commitment to local television. You have uh, obviously, and we're, the reason why, the main reason why we've uh, gotten together here is you are getting the Giants of Broadcasting uh, Electronic Art Award. Award next month at Gotham Hall in New York. Uh, congratulations. Uh, being a giant of broadcasting is just uh, in a very prestigious award. If you're, you're not aware, and I'm sure most people that listen to this are, but uh, some of the recipients this year, Al Roker uh, being one of them, Mike McVeigh, Steve Jones. I mean, you're uh, really uh, being uh, inducted with an incredible class and uh, congratulations on, on all of your awards. But where does your sense of community and sense of of giving back come from? Was that something that was instilled by your father at an early age? My parents. Yeah, it was never taught to us that you, you, know, you need to be philanthropic or you need to give more than you get. Or It, it, it was just all by example, watching him getting to go. Uh, my mom also was in the business. She had children's shows on television. And, and so it just was kind of in the DNA. And then you also have your own foundation, the Smolin Foundation. Uh, you have a hands-on. Fill me in a little bit on hands-on and uh, the smart reader in Community 101. The foundation is run by other family members, so I'm not involved in that currently. And the smart, Start Making a Reader Today, has got to be one of the best organizations. It's only in Oregon. You connect with a child 
and you read to them every week, and you get to give them books often. It's the only book in their family home at all. So these little children who otherwise would not learn to read do. So that's a wonderful one. Then in Community 101 is probably my favorite of all time because in this case, you connect with a school. The youngest student I've ever been involved with in Community 101 is was in third grade, and um, it goes up through high school. And you fund it, and then after that, they're on their own. They have a board of directors and runs better than any board I've ever been on. And we're talking about third grade through senior and high school because they take it so seriously. And they have huge bylaws that they follow very seriously. And they start out each school year doing a survey to find out, goes home with the child and families to find out what the biggest problems in the school are. Then they meet every week and analyze those problems. And then they pick a small number of problems in the community and they go after it and they meet with nonprofits who are doing what they consider to be the most important things for the community. They visit them, they study them, and then they decide who gets the money, which nonprofits. It's run very seriously. It's tough to go and listen to them and not butt in. They get you so energized because they're so smart and hardworking. And, and so each of them are in on this board of directors from their own grade school, junior high or high school, deciding what nonprofits that they give that money to. Often you'll see one of those students visiting a nonprofit uh, say a drug rehab or something where their older brother or sister once resided because they were a drug addict. So it completely changes their philosophy on community problems and what might be able to be done with those problems. Oh, I love that. What a phenomenal idea. And it's the fabulous. fact that you're helping and mentoring and teaching the kids to go and get involved at such an early age is, it's almost like, I think sometimes we do things wrong where we start teaching kids foreign languages at a later an age. When you, the younger you can teach them, the more likely they are to learn it and to be able to uh, implement it later on in life. That is so true. I will never forget one reception. It was the end of the year. The recipients of the grants have to come to the school to receive their checks. If they aren't there, the head of the organization, they don't get any money. And the kids present it. And afterwards, we were having punch and cookies. And I was talking to one of the nonprofit heads, and she said, I have to leave a little early. Um, I have to go to up north to Roseburg today. And the kid in third grade said to her, well, that makes me nervous. You're a one-person office. <laughs> And she said, well, yes, I'll just lock it up. And he said, I don't think so. <laughs> and she went to the phone and rearranged so she could go back to her office. And I was just like blown away. <laughs> that changes the rest of his life. I think the expression goes, uh, give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. Teach a man a fish, he'll uh, eat for life. And exactly. uh, that's what a wonderful organization. And yeah. thank you for everything you do for your community. I want to come up and visit. I've only been to, uh, oh, to Portland, but I'd love to love to come up. It's a beautiful, a beautiful state well, where you live. Well, it's an easy flight for you. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime you're down in LA too, you're always, you're always welcome. You've always Thank got you. a place here at Ben's town. What do you want to be remembered for? I just want to be remembered. <laughs> with, with a smile on the person's face. That's uh, all. I think, I think you're going to be more, more than remembered. Oh, uh, it's you. really an illustrious career. One more bonus question. I'm just curious. What did your dad think about, you know, Fox news and CNN? And, and you talked at the beginning when we first started the conversation about it being, you know, a fair, both sides of the story. And then as uh, cable came along, you know, a little bit, I guess, after the first decade, uh, when did Fox come around? And I think Ted Turner brought CNN made late eighties, something like that. And then Fox a few years after that. And what would he have thought of these more opinionated cable news channels? Well, he was around for them. Oh, he was. Okay. Yeah. And, um, not a big fan of the way Fox was run. Not a big fan of Mr. Murdoch. Me neither. Yeah. I did know him better previous years than now, but um, it just wasn't a big fan of all the selfishness. Yeah. Um, not that he didn't want to be successful, but it just was not for the same reasons. And 
That's yeah, I, I explained to you that HBO Showtime thing. Uh, it was the same with CNN. We weren't going to go with CNN because we were an ABC affiliate and they were starting their own satellite news channel. So we were going to stick with them. So we were the last cable system of any size in the country to go with CNN when they decided to uh, not do ABC dump the idea. And uh, Ted Turner uh, just simply could not believe that our system would be the last in the country to take them. And he would, I mean, he would invite me on his yacht for weeks and he would, you know, he would send people out every week and to sell us and they'd go back and say, no, they're telling you the truth. That's really why they're going to go with ABC, okay. who they've worked with for a long time. And he just simply could not believe that none of his salespeople could close the deal. My dad always has, had his reasons and they were usually based on not just solid business, but ethics, strong ethics. Yeah. And I, I loved that. Yeah, no, there's something to be said for that. And it sounds like it. the apple did not fall far from the tree. Uh, well, with, I didn't hear that. Thank you. Are the rest of your siblings in, involved in the business at all? They still? all were, and now they all are not. Okay, got yes. it. So, but you're still there running the day to day. Very involved in the day to day. I try not to run the, you know, each of the stations have a general manager and I try to stay out of their way unless it's just, I care too much, yeah. then they got me button in. You're an incredibly wise, Patsy, and uh, not only an amazing human being, but an amazing leader and, uh, and a trailblazer as well. And this has been just a, an absolute honor. I look forward to meeting you next month in person. Patsy, thank you so much for being a guest on the show. It means so much to me. And uh, thank you for, by the way, for your insight on uh, how you uh, prepared for interviews. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to take some of that with me for my next interview. And I can't wait to meet you in person at the Giants of Broadcasting Luncheon and uh, really excited to uh, present to you your award. Congratulations. Thank you very much. It's great to meet you. Thanks for listening to Chachi Loves Everybody. If you like the show, we hope you leave us a five-star rating and tell your friends. Make sure to follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. This has been a Benstown McVeigh podcast production. Hosted and researched by Dave Chachi Dennis. Executive producer, Darren Silva. Producer and editor, Jake Urbanic. Show coordinator, Estefania Padilla. Marketing and distribution, Suzanne Aksu and Robbie Gessel.